Cuphead is a visual masterpiece of gaming. I may be a little late to the party with this video, but I don't think there's a time limit on how much you can praise a game like Cuphead. This game is... Fuck. This game is just... Shit. Okay. This game is... God damn it. This game is hard. It's great, and I love it, but jeez, is it just hard. Well, I guess that's a, a good enough lead-in to the topic of today's video. Hello everyone, I'm James, and welcome to Design Digging. When Cuphead released, we saw a lot of discussion on the validity of difficulty in games. Whether it's alright for Cuphead to be difficult, and what being difficult implies. It implies being like Dark Souls, apparently. Now this just isn't an issue facing Cuphead. We see lots of games releasing to great praise, but still being compared to Dark Souls in their style of challenge. So I thought for today's video I would give you a practical math lesson on how it is games like Cuphead form their difficulty. At least one of the ways. There are a lot of ways, this is just one of them. Now before we get into the math of the situation, let me give you a general summary of how a game like Cuphead works. It's not that different from your general running gun platformer with a strong focus on projectiles and boss fights. Think of games like Contra, Mega Man, Ninja Gaiden, and so on. Now these games are tough and Cuphead is no different. And they all form their difficulty in a similar way. With a ton of bullets, just a ton of them going pew pew, lasers everywhere going brrrm brrrm, just bullets and lasers. Now despite all of this, none of it is without reason. It's typical of these kinds of platformers to give projectiles and enemies usually one of three types of movement. Linear, parabolic, and everyone's favorite, sinusoidal. There's also custom movements, but those normally aren't a good idea, and I'll try to mention it later. What this means is we can take games like Mario 3, Castlevania, and Cuphead, and we can express them geometrically. We can plot out where projectiles go with lines, and we end up with these neat screens that tell us how everything in the game functions. It also means that these projectiles aren't random events. They're planned, and because of that, you can do things like Toho 5 Mystic Square and have a fair and balanced game. Now this brings us to today's topic, Cuphead, Independent and Dependent Events. To demonstrate what I mean, instead of defining independent and dependent events as how they relate to games, it might be better to demonstrate it. This is a hammer bro. He throws hammers in a parabolic path. These are planned events and they are dependent on you, the player. So they're a dependent event too. They're things the game does in reaction to what you do and they can vary in strength. Cuphead does this too with Cougar Rocks serving as a weak dependent event, while Bombs serve as a strong dependent event. Sometimes they're on intervals, but most of the time they happen because of what you, the player, are doing. Now stay with me. This is a platform. This platform moves on this track independent of what you, the player, are doing. They are independent events. Things that the game does naturally without any kind of prompt or necessity from the player to make them happen. Doesn't matter if you're standing here, there, wherever, it's, it's gonna do it and it's gonna keep doing it. Cuphead has things like these too. Platforms and some enemies function independently of Cuphead. Typically they have some sort of order or track they follow, but not always. This is generally what I mean when I refer to independent and dependent events in games. It isn't exactly how they're used in math, but it's enough to fit for what we're talking about. Now individually, there is no real problem with either of these two types of events. However, making a game in just this style is pretty bland. Mario Maker stage of just a few moving platforms or just basic enemies doesn't make for a fun experience. But when you intermingle independent and dependent events, you end up with some really neat results. A normal hammer bro isn't anything too special or too challenging, but make it a fight against a hammer bro with moving platforms and various types of bullet bills, and suddenly you have a lot more going on. Now Cuphead goes through a really neat progression of these types of events, and I think the best fight that demonstrates this is the Botanic Panic Battle in Inkwell Isle 1. Potato Pal and Onion Boy both attack linearly, and their moves are mostly independent of what you do. 
They always shoot the same way and where you're standing isn't significant enough to change how their attacks function. They're solely independent attacks, and some of them are even on intervals. The Psychic Carrot fights using homing carrots and PSI. These attacks function based on your position and where you move. And not only is this part solely dependent, but it also has two varying degrees of dependent events. Most of the bosses and enemies in Inquil Isle 1 function in this either or style. They are either independent or dependent and because of this, the first island is fairly consistent with its level of challenge, and is probably one of the most enjoyable parts of the game because of it. When you get hurt or die, it's understandable and clear because you know exactly how it happened. Even against some of the more strenuous bosses, it's a level that anyone can pick up and play and do fairly well. Now Inkwell Isle 2 is where a change in approach begins to take place. Boss fights become more complex and start to include small to modern amounts of independent events as a part of their fights. Little birds, scrolling clouds, and our nice back and forth platform. This is the part of the game where they start to mix independent and dependent together and we end up with more complex stages. Look no further than Sugar Lay and Shimmy to get a good demonstration of how well planned some of these stages are. This stage features bosses whose attacks are either independent or dependent of Cuphead and tend to follow some kind of pattern. It also has a completely independent platform in the middle of the stage. And because the interval of this platform is so low, it gives you a fair amount of leeway to dodge a lot of these attacks. Generally, what this means is it gives the ability for you, the player, to skillfully avoid and maneuver around these characters. Now the fight becomes more challenging in the last phase, where our Sugar Queen throws player chasing heads, a dependent event, and we have to use our own abilities and this platform not only to attack, but also evade. By planning out the interactions between independent and dependent events, they were able to make the game a bit more difficult by putting them together instead of keeping them separate. Do you kind of see where I'm going with this? You can increase the necessary skill and playing experience by strengthening the mixing of dependent and independent events. The types of interactions of events and the results of what they have when interacting is directly responsible for how much skill and experience it will take a player to deal with the situation. Now unfortunately, not everything works out as perfect as Sugar Lay and Shimmy. While this stage has a great demonstration of different types of events and their interactions, we have other bosses like Beppy, Grim Matchstick, and Rumor Honeybottoms that are better examples of how quickly the stacking of events can get out of hand. The problem with stacking independent and dependent events is that they aren't always operating on the same frequency. In Sugar Land Shimmy, the platform scrolled back and forth over a small space. It had a very low interval, and so the odds that it wouldn't be where you needed it when the game said you needed it wasn't likely. However, some stages feature much larger intervals that cause fights to go out of sync, and when this happens, we're likely to end up with some kind of frame trapping. Up to this point, I've only really talked about how these events and attacks relate to Cuphead, and I haven't really talked about how they relate to each other. You see, not only is this platform independent to Cuphead's position, it's completely independent to everything else going on in the game. It's not in any specific position because of Sugar Queen here, it's just doing its own thing. And that's where a problem starts to develop. Remember that line tracing I did back at the beginning? That's where this starts to come into play. Now some of the more strenuous levels in Cuphead, some of the stages we've heard people explaining their discontent for, are stages where we have these kinds of problems develop. Where you have bosses completely independent of some kind of thing going on simultaneously during the fight, and the result is they end up out of sync. Beppy in the roller coaster, the clouds in Grim Matchstick, Captain Briny Beard, and a lot of his ads. These are all stages where issues arise from the unsafe mixing of events. In the case of Beppy, his attacks, especially in the Charlie Horse phase, have no bearing on the position of the roller coaster. It's likely that he could be firing his shots at the same time you're supposed to be jumping, and because of that, you get trapped into an attack. In the case of Grim Matchstick, if the clowns are not in the positions you need them to be to avoid attacks, you cannot avoid his attacks. You have to rely on these clouds being where they need to be and giving you space so that you can actually dodge his moves. And if they're not there, you just have to take a hit. 
It's part of the reason we see so many people voicing their discontent of Matchstick in particular. These are the kinds of things where you need to do that sort of tracing. When you plot out the lines and the movement of everything that's going on in the game, you start to see where these things go, what these things do, and what you need to do in order to let players actually move through the game. Because Cuphead is a game that forms its difficulty geometrically, we can plot out these lines to see where everything's going and it gives us a good idea of what we need to have happening simultaneously to make sure people who are playing the game actually have a chance to play it. When we start plotting out the lines for some of these fights, we notice that these moves take up very large amounts of the screen, but leave these safe zones where the player can move. The problem is, if we don't have those spaces accounted for, there's nothing we can really do to help the player. In the case of Grim Matchstick, if clouds are not in these positions, then you can't really expect people to move there. One of the best games to really apply this technique is Toho 5 Mystic Square. It's probably one of the best shoot 'em up games ever made, and the way it creates its difficulty is phenomenal. It also used a stacking of independent and dependent events, but focused much more on creating a geometric difficulty. Notice how many of the attacks in this game paint very clear and concise lines of movement, direction, and collision. You can look at these screens for only a few frames and have a very, very good idea of where everything is going to be. You can tell which areas are going to be safe, when and for how long, and the game gives you enough space to make it all work. Toho 5 understands that you can't stack events wildly and that you have to have good structure and planning. You have to make sure these open spaces are accounted for or you're just going to unfairly punish players. Now Cuphead does all of this too, but somewhere along the way it starts to teeter out and drops the ball on making things work. And that's where we see stages like this. Remember those custom movements I mentioned much earlier in the video? The reason those are generally not a good idea is because they lead to a serious problem of how do you plan it. How do you account for where the player is going to move, what they're going to do, and how they're going to position themselves in this game? In the case of Rumor Honeybottoms, the player can't see outside the screen's limits. They can't see where a platform is going to be in a couple of frames, and because of that, they may have to take a risky jump on a platform that may or may not be there. While I think Cuphead is a great game, the reliance on some of these bosses' moves depends upon the player having space and having the ability to tell where everything is going to be before ever getting to see it. Unfortunately, some of these stages aren't planned accordingly to make things work and the result is a lot of hindsight on what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to go. When we apply our knowledge of these events to these stages, what we see is a hope that the numbers fall in our favor and give us a sequence of platforms where we most need it. A good spot to jump and avoid some fireballs or evade bullet bees and magic triangles reliably. The more you stack independent and dependent events, the more you need to be aware of giving players space. Junkyard Jig is perhaps one of the better stages of showing this. It features many independent and dependent events that stack and become a real mess. And because of that, it often feels like you don't have enough space to really play the stage. A laser that fixes on your spot, bombs that pursue you, and a strong matchup of really dependent events. These are the areas where we begin seeing pushback from players who are calling the game too hard, and like the Overwatch loot box situation, I think this is a case of misappropriation. People are upset with reason, but they're not entirely sure why, and that's what I'm trying to offer here. The reason these stages are causing upset, the reason there's pushback against Cuphead's difficulty, isn't because the game is difficult. It's just got some bad geometry that needs to be better planned out. And that's the real problem. I've taken time to look through this game, play through it myself, and really made an effort to try and take this game apart geometrically to, to do this video. And overall, there are only a few stages that really take the fun out of it with this whole planning aspect. Most of which don't really appear until Inkwell Isle 3. And other than this, the only real problems with Cuphead are its tendencies to crash on boss fights and the poor hitboxes on just about everything. I think it's a great game and I absolutely love the look and sound of it. The way it plays is very engaging and I would love to see more games like this. I just thought it would be nice to throw a bit of math out there and show how games like Cuphead and Toho make some of their challenge. This whole geometric difficulty thing is really important to 2D platformers and to bullet hell games, so I thought it would be nice to 
try and explain it a bit. And maybe someday in the future I'll revisit this idea of geometric difficulty and give it a video all on its own. It's something that's present in a lot of platformers and a lot of shoot 'em ups and so it might be enough to, to give it its own video. With that out of the way, if you like this video and this different style of design digging, let me know. I like getting to talk about games and showing off a bit of what they did and how they do it without getting too complicated. I wanted to keep this video simple because math has a tendency to get really out of hand, so if that made anything difficult to understand or you want me to explain anything else further, don't be afraid to say so in the comments. Probably the next offbeat one of these videos will be much less mathematic. It, it's just, it'd be easier that way. Anyways, if you liked the video, let me know, subscribe to the channel to catch more videos about games and hit the notification bell, because subscribing is practically pointless if you don't, I guess. It's weird. Also, I'm on Twitter and Twitch, and until next time everyone, have a great time, play Cuphead, it is a great game, and I'll see you all next time. Bye bye!